Okay, so thanks everybody for coming. Um, a lot of people here, I'm glad a lot of people are interested in bees. Um, I can't help but share a story that was, I was thinking about the whole time that, that Eric was talking. He, he mentioned apotherapy and didn't go into much detail. And a lot of honeybee scientists get, get um, allergic reactions to bees, you develop them over time. And so beekeepers tend to not get the, the allergy as much as bee scientists because they get stung all the time. And so if you're getting stung continually, usually you don't get the allergy, but if you get stung, you know, you know, consistently, but not all the time, then you, you're more likely to get it. And so scientists like me, I, I'm doing bee stuff for a few weeks, and then I'm in the lab, you know, working with the pipettes and stuff, and then I don't get stung for a long time, and it's done again. So I have a friend who got a bee allergy, and she got anaphylactic shock, she passed out in the apiary, and they took her to the hospital, the whole, you know, the whole enchilada. And then she got this apitherapy, and she, was, she wanted a soldier on, I probably would have quit. But she wanted a soldier on it, so we went, we went with her to get this. And so it's just what Eric said. They start with a very small dose of the venom, and they give it to you in a shot. And then they build up to one you know, sting's worth of, of venom, and then you're, you're cured. But, when you, but what, what they actually do is, so if you have this, if you're allergic, you go through the, the anaphylactic shot every time that you get this shot. And so she, she was sitting there, and the nurse came over, and they, they, they gave her the shot. And she started to sweat profusely. She broke out in hives. And then she had her hand up and called the nurse. Oh, is this normal? I, I feel like I'm going to die. And then the nurse looked at her. It, it, it's fine. You know, we're watching you. And, and, that, and that's, that, that, that's how it goes. So she was sitting there terrified for an hour. And so it builds up to a crescendo of, of horribleness. And then it starts to, to level out. And she had to do this 10 times every single day, sitting there going through this. And the doctors are monitoring to see, it. is it too much? Do we have to like, you know, step in and make sure we don't die? It, it's, it, it's, it's, it's horrible. So I, I don't know what I would do if that happened to me. So it, the, in the program, it says I'm going to talk about how bees make honey and what they do with it when, when we don't steal it. I'm actually going to forego the, the second thing. Because I think the first part's much more interesting, and the second part's not so fascinating. They eat the honey. They eat it in lots of different ways. They put it to lots of uses. So you can, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. But I think their communication and how they talk to each other is the more fascinating part. So I'm going I'm to focus on that. So, so first, before I get into the, the specifics of how they make honey and how they cooperate to do that, I want to give you a, a little bit of background about how a honeybee colony works and how it's organized and who does what, sort of the overview of, of what's going on in the bee nest. And then I'll talk about who within that overall structure cooperates to make honey. So when you look at a bee nest, there's um, there are all there are thousands, you know, uh, at their maximum size, they tend to be about forty thousand bees in nature, and they all look the same. So a lot of social insects like ants and termites, they have soldiers that are really big with giant heads and big jaws, and they have little workers and medium-sized workers that are all doing different tasks. But the honeybees and the wasps, they don't have that. They have all these workers that look identical, but they're actually differentiated, and they have a strong division of labor within the nest. It's just physiological and it's temporal. So different ages of bees are doing different tasks in the nest. The honeybee has four tasks. Um, there's a new, there are newly emerged bees. These are the baby bees. There's nurses. There's middle-aged bees, and there's foragers. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these groups and what they do. So before I get to the specifics of what bees do, I think it's good to sort of you know talk in general terms about about what I mean by these these casts and how they're how they're organized. And science tend to have a lot of fancy terminology that sometimes is necessary, sometimes isn't necessary. And so if you say that the bees have so the technical term for this is polyphenism, what it means is that the bees go through puberty four times. And so it's exactly the same sort of biology that underlies these transitions that underlies our, our changes that occur at, at, at puberty. When we're young, we have certain hormonal titers. Some hormones are at low levels and some are at high levels. And that leads to us having a certain physiology and certain behavioral patterns. Then we reach a certain age and our hormonal titers change. We, we develop secondary sexual characteristics. Our behavior changes. We're interested in things we weren't interested in before. So the bees do this too, but they do it four times. And it's exactly the same sort of process. Each time they go through one of these transitions and they transition into a new task, their hormonal titers change and their body re-specializes itself for their new tasks. And so I just have one example here. So the, the bees have these different glands all throughout their body, and the glands are specialized for, for different tasks depending on what they're doing. So one of these is called the hypopharyngeal gland. It's, the, it's a big gland in their mouth that they use to secrete brood food when they're young. And so this is, you can kind of see here that this gland is at its maximum size 
when they're in this, this age range, and this is the nursing age range. So before that, it's, it's really small, and then when they transition out of this cast, it drops in size really quickly. At the concurrent with this drop in size, there's an increase in the, in the invertase content. So invertase is an enzyme that, that converts nectar into honey. It basically modifies the, the, the sugar concentration in the nectar and makes it more stable over time. And so when the bees are secreting brood food, they're not making any of this invertase. But then when they stop secreting the brood food, then they turn on this other function. They start, because the middle-aged bees are processing nectar into honey. And so depending on what the bee is doing, these, this is just one gland, but there's glands all throughout the body. And so this is happening you know, in, in many different tissues throughout the bee's body every time they make one of these transitions. And then there are hormonal changes. They don't have testosterone and estrogen like we have. But they have sort of insect equivalents. They have like a juvenile hormone and a bunch of other hormones that are specific to insects, but which serve the same purpose as, as our, our, our hormones. So I just want to run through the, the, the four groups and, and what they do. So the newly emerged bees do the least. They don't, they don't do a whole lot. And these are the baby bees. And so here this picture is of bees emerging. So this is a comb. This is, this is comb that's um, closed brood, cat brood. And then this bee is, has just chewed its way out. That's just its, that's its head. It's, in, it's about to pull itself out of the comb. These two bees are chewing their way out of the comb. And so when a bee first emerges, when it chews its way out of the comb, its, it's, its skin, its cuticle is soft. It hasn't hardened yet. Its flight muscles aren't mature yet. All of its physiology is still immature. And so the bee is still maturing. And it doesn't really complete you know, its development until about three days. And so the first few days of a bee's life, it doesn't really do much of anything except eat pollen, stand around, and continue development. The one task that it does do is it, it cleans cells. And so the, they tend to stay in this, this brood zone. So this is a honeybee nest. There's a lot of honey at the top. And then there's a, a big brood zone at the bottom. And the brood zone is a lot um, warmer than the honey zone. And so they, it's fa they can continue development faster if they stay in here. So basically they stand around in here, they clean cells, and they, they eat a lot, and they don't, they don't do a whole lot. They're kind of like our kids. They have, they have a few chores, but they're not really required to work as hard as the other, as the other bees. So their first real job is to be a nurse bee. So the nurse bees, um, they have a physiology that's specialized for feeding the young, and they also feed the queen. So this is a, a nurse bee on uh, some comb with, with larvae. So the, the big fat larvae are older, they require more feeding. The little small ones require less feeding. And so the nurses, they go around, they inspect, they see who needs, you know, how much food and they give it to them. They also feed the queen. The queen is basically a big giant egg laying machine. Behaviorally, she's really simple. She can't really f care for herself. She can't do much of anything except lay eggs. And she, can't, she doesn't really feed herself. So these nurses feed her. And, they, and then what's, what's kind of interesting is that they feed her at a rate at which they want her to, egg, to lay eggs. And so at some times of the year, she's laying a lot of eggs. And then the nurses are feeding her a lot. At other times of the year, the, the, there's not a lot of food out there. And the colony's not growing anymore. They're, they're just trying to maintain. Then they feed her much less. And so they control her egg laying rate by, by, how, by how much they're feeding her. So the middle-aged bees do all the work within the nest except for the brood care. They, their main tasks are they, they process nectar into honey. So the foragers, they collect the nectar, but they don't do anything with it in the nest. They just collect the nectar in the field, they come back, and they unload that nectar load to one of these middle-aged bees. And then the middle-aged bee turns it into honey, carries it up to the top of the nest, and unloads it in a cell, and then goes back to get a new load. And so this is uh, some honeycomb where they filled up all these cells and they're capping these cells. They also have to decrease the moisture content in nectar. So nectar is very high in water, and it would, it would spoil if the bees didn't concentrate it. And so the, the, the concentrating of the nectar into honey is, is, requires a lot of labor, and these bees do that. They also um, make, they secrete the wax, and they make the comb. That's their other major task. But they do a lot of minor things, too. They seal cracks in the nest. They clean up the nest. If there's damage, they'll fix the damage. They guard the entrance. These are guard bees. They have this characteristic posture, this guarding posture, where they put their first two legs up. And it's one of these cool animal behavior, animal behaviors where the, the behavior looks exactly like what it is. And so they, they, they position themselves in the front in this stance, and then every time a bee lands from the field, they rush over and they inspect them. And if they like them, they let them in, and if not, they, they attack them. And so it's, it's, a, it's a really cool behavior to watch. So the foragers obviously are getting food. They do no work within the nest anymore. All they do is they, they forage during the day and at night they go to sleep. People have shown 
physiologists have shown that they're actually sleeping at night by showing that their brain has a characteristic you know, pattern of activity that's characteristic of, of sleep. But they forage for nectar, they forage for pollen, these are pollen loads. They forage for water if it's hot outside, they forage for a propolis if they need to seal cracks. And then most, inter most interestingly, they, they, they're the ones that produce all of these signals. They do all the dances, they do all of the, the communication stuff that I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. So in general terms, before I get to the, 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 the in-depth sort of part of, of how they, they communicate, I want to give you just a, an overview of, of communication. So this is true of all the social insects, the ants, the bees, the termites, and the, and the and bees. Ants, bees, wasps, termites. Those, those are the four major groups. And so most of their communication is chemical. These are pheromones, and they use these pheromones in lots of different contexts. So the queen signals her fertility with a, with a queen pheromone. There's alarm pheromones that Eric talked about that the guards release that you know, stimulates aggression and marks you for attack. They, there's a little flower visitation pheromone. So when a bee, there are these little glands on their leg, on their feet, and when they walk around on the flower, they leave these foot marks. And then if another bee comes, it, it can sense those foot marks and it knows that a bee was just here. And so there's no point visiting this flower because some other bee just got the nectar out of it. And so after the foot marks you know, evaporate, the, the, the timing of how long it takes to evaporate, you know, the, for the foot marks to evaporate, is how long the flower takes to fill back up with nectar. And so they can signal to each other that this flower has already been visited, don't bother. They have colony membership chemicals, and so every colony has a characteristic odor, and that's how bees know that this particular bee is a member of my nest and not a member of another nest. And so if a member from another nest comes on, they'll, they'll attack that bee because it smells different. And then like all animals, they have mate attraction signals. The queen has some, some mate attraction signals the drone uses to locate her. But these are chemicals, and they're not, unless you want to talk about the biochemistry of it, and how, this, how they're synthesized, and how they break down, and, and, and so forth, they're not, they're not as interesting to a lot of people as, as at least to me, as, as the mechanical acoustical sort of signals, the dances. So I'm going to focus on all of these, these dances, and what they mean, and how we know, you know, how, we, how we've learned what they mean. So first of all, there, there's all these different casts of bees within the nest. And the question is, you know, who's, who's talking to who? Do they all participate? Do they all make signals? Um, it turns out that only the foragers are making the signals. The foragers make the signals, and all the other bees listen. So the, the foragers, they talk to themselves, and they talk to the middle-aged bees. It's not clear that the nurses are actually listening to any of these, these signals. It, it, it could be, but it's, it, it seems to be that these two groups are the, are the major groups. And they share two kinds of information. So the, the foragers, when they're talking to each other, they're basically sharing information about what's going on in the environment. So if you think about a, a time when, it's, when there's a dearth, when there's, when there's no flowers blooming and the bees aren't able to get any nectar, but the bees are still scouting around, so they're looking for stuff. And so the, when a bee does find a, a, a good food source, like a field of sunflowers like this, that first bee, that scout that finds it, will then go back and tell all the other bees, you know, I found a good food source, here it is. And so they're sharing information about, you know, what's available in the environment and how you can go and get it. When they're talking to the middle-aged bees, they're usually coordinating activities. So these coordinating activity signals are a lot more numerous than these, these kinds of signals, even though they're not as famous as, the, as, as these ones. And so coordinating activities is kind of illustrated by this, this operating room. So if we imagine that this operating room had a doctor and a nurse and technicians and an anesthesiologist and everybody, I'm kind of squeamish, and so I didn't show a picture of somebody cut open, you know, <coughs> on the table. But if you imagine that there was a person there cut open on the table and there was a bunch of people, you know, working on that person, then you would need, it's, it's, it's easy to know that, you, that you, need co you need cooperation, you need coordination. So the anesthesiologist has to have that person sedated to just the right level for the stage of the operation. The nurses have to sort of, you know, preempt what the, they have to have a sense of what's going to come next. They have to have all the tools that are going to be needed, you know, there, they have to be ready, they have to be, so everybody has to coordinate with everybody else to make sure that the whole operation goes smoothly. And so that's what the bees need to do. They need to coordinate their activities to make sure that everything goes smoothly. And in general terms, even though uh, uh, we talk about these as societies, I think they're, they're, they're equally, you can equally think about them as organisms. And so the, the, the honeybee colony, or a large ant colony, 
They have a reproductive individual, a queen, and then they have all these workers that are usually sterile. And so it's the same sort of pattern that we see in our bodies. We have some reproductive cells, and then we have somatic cells that, that are just you know, doing work. And so then there's, co and then there's coordination because we're one organism. So the, the, the social insect colony is, is the same way. It's, it's, an, it's a diffuse organism in which the individual units aren't cells, they're, they're actual animals. But the same coordination problems you know, exist. So the, the problem is to make sure that the animal, the, the colony, acts with a unity of purpose. So let's hope these, these videos work. And I should say that I have a terrible video of the Bible dance. I, I thought I had a really good video of this, but I didn't. And at the last minute, I had to ask a, a friend for a video, and he gave me the worst video ever. <laughs> he actually gave me a really so I. It, the video that he gave me is a, is a video of the, is a really fancy, high performance video of the waggle dance that's slowed down so you can see exactly what it's doing. But, but it, it sort of defeats the purpose because the bee is moving so slowly that, you know, it just, it, 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 look, it looks ridiculous. And so I went with this, with this other video. So we're going to have to watch this several times to get a, a feeling for, what, for what's going on. So the bee is going to be dancing right in here, and it only does three, three waggle rounds, which is the reason why it's not, it's not a, terrible good, a terribly good video. So it's this bee right here. This part is called the waggle run, where it's waggling in a direction, and then it turns around and does it again. So let me play it again. So, th so there it is. This is the waggle run, and then it turns around and does it again. And so if you watch it one more time, you can see that there's bees that are paying attention to this, to this dance. So you can see this bee right here is following. It's really interested in what's, in what's going on. So basically there's a bee that's dancing. It's doing the, um, there's a bee performing the signal, which is a waggle dance. And so the, the bee is, is, oh, I tried to stop that. So the, the bee is, is waggling in a, in a direction, we call that the run, and then it turns around and does it again, and that's another run. And then there are, there are between usually three to five bees that are following in the footsteps of the dancing bee, and those are the followers. And so if you follow these followers, after they followed one of these dances, they'll show up at the place that the bee was, was dancing for. So a little bit about the history of this dance. People have been studying bees and fascinated by bees for, for literally thousands of years. So there's, there's, there's quotations in Aristotle about bees and their division of labor. People have always found them fascinating because historically, honey was one of the few sources of really rich, sweet food that humans had access to. And people have always been fascinated by how they all work together and how they cooperate and so forth. And so people had seen this dance for a really long period of time. Hundreds of years ago, people already had observation hives. An observation hive is a hive that has a glass wall so that you can see what's going on inside. And people made them of glass. I think at one point someone made them one of really thin bone to see what was going on in there. So the first idea about this was that it was a dance of joy, which was a pre-evolutionary biology sort of idea. And so people knew that bees that had found a food source were likely to come back and do this dance. And so their, their idea was that it's celebrating having found the, the food with this dance of joy. We don't really believe that anymore, but <laughs> probably a better world that we would live in if that was true, but it doesn't seem to be the case. So what we think about it today is that it, it serves to communicate food sources. And this person, Carl von Frisch, is the person who is most associated with discovering that. So this is Carl von Frisch. Usually at this point, you, you, you have a picture of somebody you know, smiling, looking very welcoming and accommodating. And I looked hard for a picture of <laughs> von Frisch where he was smiling and looking really friendly, and I, I couldn't find one. And not, which isn't to say he's not a nice guy, because I've, I've always heard that he was a very nice guy, but he's just a very German you know, man. Like he's a very serious, hair doctor, professor type of, of, of person. This is actually the nicest picture. Usually he's like scowling. But he was a very famous guy before he even did the, the waggle dance stuff. So he, the first stuff that he did was bees was on color vision, so he showed that bees can see different colors. He showed that, that bees can see polarized light, which is a pattern of light that in the sky that we can't see, but which bees and lots of other animals can see. So he's already really well known before, and he did a lot of stuff with memory too. But bees have really good memories for stuff, and Von Frisch worked on that also. So then in the 30s, he started working on the bio dance, maybe even a little bit before that. And he finished more or less in the 1940s. 
So he's working on this for a very long period of time. And so probably for two reasons. One, it was parts of the problem were very hard to solve, and so he, he, he needed to work really hard to, to solve the problem. But also, he was just incredibly meticulous and thorough. And for two reasons. One, he was German, and they're always very meticulous and thorough. But in this case, he was even more meticulous and thorough than usual, because it's one of these things where it's, it's, it's so, you know, um, people were really skeptical that bees could talk to each other. And so there was a huge burden of proof, because people were incredibly skeptical about this being a real thing, that bees could talk to each other. So he had to do not just you know, one definitive experiment, but a definitive experiment and then 15 more definitive experiments. And then even after that, there were people who still didn't buy it. And it's still being studied today. So we know what the wild dance, you know, um, we know what it means, we know how they use it, but there are a lot of people, especially in neurobiology, who are still studying how the bee's you know, brain is wired up to send and receive this information. So it's still being worked on today at a more you know, fine scale level. So how did von Frisch figure out the, the meaning of the wild dance? So he hypothesized that the bees are telling each other the location of, of food sources. So I should say that this, this hypothesis and, and what von Frisch did it's kind of like what, what Charles Darwin did, in the sense that his idea that, 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 that the bees can talk to each other and tell each other where food is was a, was a pretty widespread idea. So in Darwin's time, most of the naturalists believed in evolution of some sort or another. So what Darwin did was figure out a mechanism by which evolution can occur. And so he, he sort of took this idea that a lot of people believed in, but there was very you know, weak proof or no proof for it, and he found proof and he convinced the skeptics. And so von Frisch did something very similar. People knew for a long period of time that, well, they didn't know, but people suspected. So if you're at a, at a picnic table in the summer and you've got like a Coke or something sweet in a dish on your table, and a bee, and there's no bees, but then suddenly one bee finds it, then within you know, 10, 15 minutes, you can be overwhelmed with bees. So the, 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 the probability of them just all randomly finding it after that first bee found, found it is pretty small. So people were suspicious for a long period of time that bees must be able to tell each other where food is, because how could they all just show up after the first one showed up? And so he, he figured out how they, how they do it. But the idea was kind of widespread even before that. So he got scientific on it, but you know, people already suspected it. So what, 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 he, what he hypothesized is that if, if they are telling each other where food is, they would have to communicate the distance and the direction to the food source. So there are other alternatives. They could you know, just give each other a location like, like we would with a map, but that's kind of far-fetched. And so the simplest way to tell somebody where something is is, is to tell them what direction to go and then how many steps, you know, how far to go in that direction. So he hypothesized that that's what the bees are doing. They're telling each other the distance and the direction to the food source. So if that's true, then then as the distance to a food source gets longer, something about the, the waggle dance must change in order to transmit that information, if it's really conveying this information. And likewise, if it's telling bees the direction, then, that, then as the direction to a food source changes, something about the waggle dance must change if it's going to convey that information. So von Frisch went about experimentally figuring out you know, what, what these two things are. I should say, before we get to the experiment, the methods that he used are all based on, on training bees to feeders. And so it's really easy to, to get a jar of, of sugar water, flip it upside down on, on glass that has grooves all around it. You can put some, some odor, some scent in the sugar water. It helps if you do that. And then you can train bees to these, to these sources of to these artificial feeders. And then when the bee is, is, is feeding right here, you can put a dab of paint on its back so that you know that this bee you know, just visited the feeder. And then if you have an observation hive, a glass walled hive, the person, you can have a radio walkie-talkie, you can communicate and say, all right, I just marked this bee yellow, it's coming back. And then that person can say, all right, it just got back. And then you can figure out, you know, what it does. And so one of the things he discovered first is that if you have a very dilute sugar water, the bees, when they come back, they won't dance at all. And so right away he knows that bees are only advertised. And then, and then if, you make it very, if you make it very thick, very heavy syrup, then the bees will dance for the same site. And so he knows that they're, they're only signaling very good you know, um, food resources, high quality nectars, not low quality nectars. So the first experiment that he did was the distance experiment. And so there's two variables. There's distance and direction. We want to just change one at a time. 
And so in this experiment, he has a nest, which is an observation hive, which is the glass walled hive. And then he has a bunch of feeders that are spread out in this array. And they're all in the same direction, but they change, but they get farther and farther away. And so he, he varied from, I think, about 50 meters all the way out to about 10 kilometers. And so these were really big experiments. He was in charge of a lot of people. He was here, Dr. Von. The, the Germans have incredibly, you know, elaborate titles. Here, Dr., you know, they, they was like, I can't remember his title, but it was very long. And so if you have a very long title like that, you're in charge of lots of people. And so he had, <laughs> he had a lot of people, way more people than I've ever had. And so he, he, could, he could put this array out 10 miles, like literally, and, and they went through, they, what if the bees, can, can they go over lakes, can they go over mountains, can they go around barns, and everything you can think of, he did it. But we're gonna talk about the simplest version of this. And so on day one, he trains the bees to the first of these feeders, and then he marks them, you know, with paint mark after they visit the feeder, so he knows that, you know, these are, because there's all kinds of bees in the nest, and they're visiting other places in the environment, too. So you want to just look at the ones that visited here. And so then, after he marks a bee that just visited here, it goes back, and his assistant records everything about the waggle dance. You know, how long the run is in terms of distance, how long it took in terms of time, how quickly the bee, you know, uh, made the run, how, how many runs they made. Basically, every single variable you can think of about the waggle run they record after training a bee to this first one. And then on the next day, they train the bee to the second one and do the same thing, record everything about the waggle dance. Then on the third day, they train it, and then so on and so forth, all the way out to 10 miles. And what he found is that if the waggle dance is this, you know, this, this run, and then it turns around and does it again, like we saw in the video, the run part gets longer as the distance gets greater. So it seems to be the case that the run part is what tells the bee how far away the, the, um, the food sources. And so it, it, hypothetically speaking, you could say that you know, a, a run of one centimeter equals one mile, then two centimeters would equal two miles, that sort of thing. So then he did the opposite experiment, <coughs> where he kept the distance the same, but changed the angle. And so he did this in 360 degrees. And so it's the same sort of experiment. On day one, he trains the bees to this place and records everything about the waggle dance. Then on day two, they go here and then all the way around in a circle. And they're recording everything about the waggle dance after, after they train the bees to each of these locations. And what he found is that as you, as you go around in the circle, the angle of the waggle run changes. And so the angle of the waggle run is, 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 is what's telling the bee the direction to the food source. And so I'm not going to go through the, the, the further experiments, but what he found subsequently is that in the, in the hive, they're dancing vertically because the, they're, the, they're in a tree nest on a vertical surface. And so they're dancing in, in, in this plane. And so for example, say we have a, a bee that's dancing 90 degrees. And so the, the dance is going in, in this direction from vertical. They're dancing in this direction. What he found is that when they go outside, they translate that vertical um, reference point to the sun. And so when you go outside, you find the sun, say the sun is over there, and then, they're dan then the, the location of the food is 90 degrees from that. So there's, there's a translating mechanism that goes on where they translate the vertical, you know, the, the vertically referenced angle to a sun referenced angle. And so he did a lot of experiments to figure that out, but they're a little more involved. And what's interesting is that if you make bees dance outside, you know, on a swarm or um, if they have built, you know, comb outside instead of in a nest, then they will dance directly in the direction that they want the other bee to go. It's only when they're inside in the dark that they do this mechanism of translating from vertical to, to a sun referenced um, direction. I should also say before I forget, there, we're gonna go through a lot of these signals and they're all named something like the waggle dance, the shaking thing or something like this. It's all sort of, they all have names that make sense to us as people, but it's good to keep in mind that all of these signals are happening in the dark of the nest and so the bees can't see each other. So there, these, these signals are either transmitted via sound or substrate vibrations, or the, the bee has to keep its antenna in contact with the bee in front of it. And so they're, they're not actually perceiving these dances the way we would you know, perceive them by watching. It's something else that's going on. So we give, we give these things you know, convenient names based on what they look like. But the actual transmission of information is via some other mechanism. So in summary, the bees can tell each other the distance and the direction of food sources. Something I didn't mention is that they can also tell each other what kind of food it is. Because when a bee comes back from a particular kind of flower, like dandelion, for example, they smell like dandelion. 
or they smell like cherries, or they smell like apples. And so when the bee is following the dance, it also pays attention to what that, what that bee that's dancing smells like. And so they know that I have to go, you know, four miles, you know, 90 degrees from the sun, and then I have to look for dandelions. And so we have lots of experiments by changing the odor at the different feeders. He showed that they actually are looking for the smell that they smelled on the, on the, on the bee that was dancing, and not just for food in that location. So there's one more signal about the environment that we're going to talk about. <clears throat> so I want to set this up by talking a little bit about what the video is of. And so this was a um, video taken by James Nye from San Diego. So he was doing an experiment where he had bees trained to a feeder. And then when they're at the feeder, he simulates a t an attack by a predator on the bee by pinching the leg of the bee as it's drinking the sugar water. And then he records what the bee does when it gets back to the nest. And so this is a bee that went to some source that was advertised as a recruit. Some bee was dancing for this side, it shows up, it gets attacked there, and then it goes back. So this is what they, what they do when that happens. Is there a sound? Well, there's supposed to be sound. I'm not, I'm not actually getting sound, but um, this bee is really agitated, you can see. And it's making these, these lunging mo movements at the other bees. And so every time it makes one of these lunging mo movements, it makes this, this piping sound, this beep, beep, beep. And so you have, this is a fancy microphone for, for recording that. So this bee comes in, it doesn't do waggle dancing, it doesn't do anything like that. It just goes around and it headbutts lots of other bees and makes this, this piping sound. And so what James found is that although they, they headbutt a lot of different bees all throughout the nest, they have a strong bias for headbutting bees that are dancing from the place that they just got back from. And they can do that by the odor. So he, he changed the odor that was at the, at the site that they were harassed at, and he found that when they got back, they would just, they were at a strong preference for headbutting bees that also smelled like where they just got back from. So what it means is that I got beat up at that place. Stop <laughs> dancing for that place. Don't go there. And so this bee was told to go there by one of the other bees. It flew out there, it got beat up, <clears throat> and then it got back. And you know now its job is to shut down recruitment for that place. That's not a good place to go. So now I'm going to talk about the coordinating activity signal. So I'll talk a little bit about what coordination of activity is in, in, in human terms, because what the bees do is, is pretty similar. <clears throat> so if you think about a task that we're doing, like building a wall, you have somebody who's laying bricks, you have somebody who's making cement, and you have somebody, a laborer, who's carrying the bricks and the cement over to the person who's laying them. And we need to coordinate you know, these activities if we're going to make this happen in the most efficient way possible. And so there's two ways that you can kind of you know, think about how you can do it. You can do it actively or you can do it passively. If you're doing it actively, then what I'm calling active is when you're vocally communicating as you go what should be happening. So this is the way we usually do it. The person here <coughs> will say, no, you're not going fast enough, bringing the bricks over, go faster. Or the person, you know, you, you who's you know, making the cement, you're not going fast enough. Or if the guy who's laying the bricks has laid more bricks than we're gonna lay in an, in an entire week, then that's a wasted effort. You should go and help the person who's making cement, or you should help me lay bricks. And so you wanna make sure that you have the proper amount of work allocated to each of these three tasks, otherwise you're wasting labor. And so you have this coordination of you know, work problem is to make sure that you are maximally efficient in terms of how you're using your, your work resources. But if we imagine that these people hate each other and they refuse to talk to each other, they could still do it passively. So the person who is bringing the bricks over could just pay attention to whether or not there are bricks available for the person who's laying them. If there are no bricks, then they could bring more bricks. Or they could pay attention to how quickly the bricks are disappearing and then try to match that. So you could, you could just use, but it's not as efficient as making proactive sort of signals about, you know, you should be doing more of this or less of that. So the bees do this kind of both of these kinds of things. They tell each other beforehand, and sometimes they wait until things go wrong, and then they make some corrective action. But their goal is always the same as this, to, to make sure that there's not wasted effort, that somebody's not, way, not, not you know, bringing over way more bricks than are gonna be necessary. So the three things that they're trying to coordinate is the, the collecting of nectar, the processing of nectar into honey, and then the building of more wax 
to store them. And so if any of these get out of whack, they're not, they're not maximally efficient. So the, as I said, the foragers go out and they collect the nectar, but they don't process the nectar. They go out, they collect the nectar, they come back to the bottom of the nest, they unload their nectar to a middle-aged bee. That middle-aged bee turns it into honey and then puts it into comb. And so if they run out of space to store, you know, because there's not enough wax, then, then the whole process shuts down. Or if there's nobody to unload, um, you know, um, nectar to, then, then the foragers can't keep foraging. And if there's way too many bees here, <coughs> then some of these bees should, should go up here and start, and start foraging if they're going to maximize the, the work output. So I want to talk a little bit about how they coordinate this, these, these, these tasks. So the first one is called the, the shaking signal. And, and I have to apologize because I don't actually have a video of this. But I found one on YouTube, so maybe we can watch this one. I thought about just getting a picture, but it's one of the cooler signals that they do because it looks just like what, what it is and what it, what it does. Hopefully it didn't boot me off the, the internet while I was talking. So that's, that's the shaking signal. This bee runs up to other bees, it grabs them, and literally it shakes them. <laughs> so it, it, when it does this, it walks all around the nest. And so usually foragers stay at the bottom of the nest, and there they, they do their unloading, and, they, and they, they do the waggle dance, it's called the dance floor. But when they're making the shaking signal, they walk all throughout the nest. They go up to the honey storage area, they go all throughout the brood zone, they go everywhere, and they just shake bees. So what does this shaking signal mean? So we know what this means because of the context in which bees do it. So these are foragers that are doing the shaking signal. They've decided to do the shaking signal and not the waggle dance. And so they tend to do this signal early in the morning after their first you know, couple runs out foraging. So early in the morning, there's no foraging going on. The, the, the colony's not very active. Nobody's really doing anything. Middle-aged bees are just hanging out. They're just, they're just you know, taking it easy. And so, there's nobody basically available to receive nectar. And so when a forager goes out for the first time, it comes back, it doesn't even bother trying to find somebody to receive the nectar, because he, he knows that the middle-aged bees aren't even around, they're just taking it easy. And so instead, she goes all around the nest performing the shaking signal. And what people have found after, before and after a bee receives one of these shaking signals is that their activity rate goes up. And so basically, it's, it's, it, the meaning of it is simply get, you know, get ready, get busy, we're ready to go. And so the foragers signal that they're gonna start the work day and everybody should get ready to start working by going around and shaking everybody awake. So it's one of these preemptive sort of things. Before, they even, before the system even gets going, the very first few scouts wake everybody up before things could possibly get out of whack. So then we have another dance called the, the tremble dance. And so this is the same video before. This video has two parts, actually. The first part's the waggle dance, and then the second part's the, the tremble dance. So that's our rival dancer. We'll just wait until she's finished. So this bee right here where the microphone is, that's the bee that's treble dancing now. So basically it's a discombobulated, spastic waggle dance. They, they kind of waggle around, but they don't make a nice figure eight. They just sort of, and they do this all over the nest like they do for the, the shaking signal. They walk all around trembling in that way. Let's watch it again. So it's this, it's this trembling, you know, spastic dance is the dance that, that we're talking about now. It's called the tremble dance. So people have known about this dance also for a long period of time. Juan Frisch and others have seen it in their observation hives. And the question was always, is this a signal or is this a sick? You know, confused B is it trying to waggle dance, but it can't get the job done because of some psychotic behavior or something. Or eventually, people people did think it was a signal because they do a lot of it, and they seem to do it in in, in a in a stereotyped way at certain times of day. And so people were pretty sure that it was a signal, but it wasn't worked out for a very long time. Only within the last ten years or so, have people figured out what the tremble dance means. And so what it means is that. Well, I should say a little bit about what, what a good coordination of action means 
for the nectar foragers and the nectar receivers. So what it means is that the, the nectar foragers are going out, they're getting nectar, and then they want to unload it to a middle-aged bee who then processes it into honey and then comes back. And so both of these groups are making circuits. The, the foragers are going out, they're getting honey, they're coming back, they're unloading. The middle-aged bees are taking the, you know, they're unloading to the middle-aged bees who get the handoff and they go and they make honey and they come back. And so ideally, the forager wants to come back, quickly unload, and then go back out to the flower again. And so if, what, what people have found is that when a bee comes back from, from, the, from the field with nectar, and then it can't get unloaded, it searches all around and it can't find somebody to unload it because there aren't enough receivers, then instead of waggle dancing, instead of going back to the, the food source, they then start to do this tremble dance. And so then they go all around the nest doing this tremble dance. And then what people have found after that is that the number of receivers in the dance floor area, the bottom of the nest, goes up. And so what it means is the context is that we need more processors, I can't get unloaded. And so there would be no point to dance, because then you'd be making, sending more bees out to the site and making the imbalance even worse. And there's no point going back to the food, because there's not enough bees to do the unloading right now. And so they stop, the, they, they stop what they're doing, and they recruit more, more receivers, more unloaders, before they continue with their, with their dancing. And the final portion of this problem is the waxworking problem. The honeybee nest is really large compared to the size of the bee. There's lots and lots of wax. So how do they control that, you know, how much wax they should make at what particular time? And the answer is that we don't know. And so I thought I'd throw that in because people have been studying honeybees for, for 80 years, at least really intensively, you know, um, in a scientific sort of way. And there's still major problems that we don't understand, like how they control wax working. There are lots of ideas, but, but there's no definitive, you know, convincing experiment. That, that demonstrates how they actually do it. Some, some you know, um, good hypotheses are that the treble or stop signal could be involved because they don't, they produce these signals in multiple contexts. So sometimes we see a bee treble dancing that didn't have problems unloading. And so could, could, the, could the signal mean more than one thing in different contexts? People, people speculate that it could. The stop signal, like I said, it's biased towards bees that are dancing for a particular site, but they also headbutt other bees and so, it could be the case that it has context-specific context meaning, but again, we don't, we don't really know. So the take-home message is that, that bees have small brains, but they can solve really big problems. And so this, this basic you know, concept has led to this field called swarm intelligence, which is, which is a big topic right now in artificial intelligence. So the idea is that bees and ants solve problems in a really different way than we solve them. So we tend to have a, a, a central organizing, a central processor, our, our brain, which is this big giant instrument that can process lots and lots of information, and then be a leader. You know, it can organize everybody, all the other you know, sub-components down, down in the organization. So we call that a centralized intelligence. Whereas bees and ants have a decentralized intelligence or a distributed intelligence, such that there is no leader, there's no you know, big brain bee or big brain ant. They all are basically doing the same thing. They're following these simple rules of thumb. But then the collective consequences of these simple rules of thumb is that they all work together in a coordinated sort of way. And so there are some instances in which we, we would like to be able to do that also. So I went to a conference that was organized by NASA. Their idea is that they want to land all kinds of little robots on the moon. And then these little robots will go out and they'll collect different substances and they'll put them in piles and they'll, and they'll put them in boxes and load them onto the moon bot or whatever. And so the, the, the reason they would rather have something like ants or bees instead of a central processor, some more complicated thing, is that maybe the central processor gets you know, damaged in the landing. So if you, the problem with a, with a centralized machine is that if, if the one leader element breaks, then the whole thing is useless. Whereas if you have decentralized or distributed intelligence, you can, you can lose some of the elements, you can crush half of them, the other ones will pick up the pieces and, and continue to move on. So lots of people are, just, are programming robots with ant and bee inspired algorithms. This isn't a video, it's just a, a snapshot of, of these little robots that have aggregated. And so what they can do is they can aggregate, they can follow trails, they can tell each other simple things like ants and bees do. And so the hope is that one day we'll have robots that can you know, do the same sort of tasks that ants and bees do with very little um, processing capacity, very simple you know, computers in their brains. So there's some more reading in case you're interested in this stuff. Von Frisch worked on this for his entire life, and he wrote lots of books. His big, his big book is this one, The Dance Language and Orientation of Bees. And then the person who picked up the, this, this, this topic when, when Von Frisch left off was, 
Tom Seeley, who was my advisor at Cornell, so he, he's written several books. And this is his most recent book. He's talking at different places around the country about this book now. It's about how bees decide where to live in the context of swarming and finding a new house. They use all these signals, both in the swarming context and in the food collection process. So this other book is about how all the stuff that I talked about today, basically, is either from this or from other people. I did some work myself on how they, co how they coordinate in the context of food collection. But they also do lots of stuff in swarming, too. So these are books that are available at you know, uh, bookstores. So that's what I have. Thanks. What's the purpose of, of queen piping? So I mean, when, when the queen is, 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 is piping herself in the context of, of swarming. That's one of the signals that people don't really know what it, what it means. And so the, the, the queen, when, she's, when, when, the, when the colony is, is, is going to swarm, they produce many more queens than they need in these, in these, these, these queen cells. And sometimes, the, so the, the, the way it's supposed to work is the first queen to emerge will then sting all the other queens to death, and then she'll be the one that wins. But sometimes they don't allow the queen to do that. Sometimes the bees will fasten onto her and hold her down. And she tends to do a lot of piping in that context. But she also pipes in other contexts. And so some people think that the piping correlates with how much she wants to be fed. Or the piping correlates with how much she, so she gets shaken a lot too. The queen, during the swarming process, she, gets, she receives thousands of these shaking signals. And so people think it could be associated with getting her ready for swarming. And so what's confusing about a lot of these coordination signals, unlike the Weigel dance, which has one meaning. So when you look at the Weigel dance, it, it has one simple meaning. So it's easy to figure out what it means. But the stop signal, the tremble dance, the, the piping signals, the queen piping, the worker piping, all of these pipe, they do it in lots and lots of different contexts. And so it's really hard to figure out what it means because it, it could, be, it, you have to know the context, you know, specific purpose of it. So, the simple answer is we don't know what that one means. Right. Yeah, Brian, uh, I've always been uh, intrigued by the uh, swarming propagation of bees. Is there a way that the bees communicate with each other of who's going to go in the swarm? That's another one that people speculate about, but but nobody knows. People have you know recorded that that um, it tends to be the the younger well the is it the older or the younger bees that that go. There's, a, there's an age bias in who tends to leave. And you get a, a cross-section of the whole colony that leaves in the swarm. But it's not clear if, 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 if it's more fine-scaled than that. People have looked at whether or not different patcher lines, there's different patterns of relatedness in the nest. And that, that's not involved. All the different patcher lines go. All the different ages go, but there's a slight age bias. Something that happens that's kind of interesting in swarming is that even before they, they swarm, the scouts are usually looking for other places to go. So even before the... The, the swarm has picked up. The scouts are already searching. But it, yeah, that, that, that's it's, it's, it's not also not known. One more question. Uh, in terms of advantageous physiology, why why do they see polarized light? Is there a reason or expectation? I can understand color, right? The simple power or some attraction, but what would polarized light do for them to help them find more nectar? Right, you asked that one. That's one that we have an answer for. So the, he asked, why do they see? Why would they need to see polarized light? So the, the polarized light is a is a pattern of, of light in the sky that, that changes with where the sun is. And so it's sort of the sun is if it's low on the horizon, you get you get a certain pattern because it's hitting the air at, at a certain angle. And then when it's higher in the sky, it's it's hitting the atmosphere at a different angles so to get a pattern of polarized light that correlates with where the sun is in the sky. And so the bees need to know where the sun is because that's that's how they're referencing which direction to dance in. So if it's cloudy day and they can't see the sun, they, then, then they couldn't use the dance language. But if they can see polarized light, then you can infer where the sun is just by seeing any patch of sky. And so if it's 90% cloudy and there's just one patch of sky, based on the pattern of polarized light there, the bees can infer where the sun is, and then they can use the dance language. And so it would have to be completely cloudy. So it's a, it's a really useful thing. Lots of animals use polarized light in lots of contexts. A lot of people here, I'm glad a lot of people are interested in bees. Um, I can't help but share a story that was, I was thinking about the whole time that, that Eric was talking. He, he mentioned apotherapy and didn't go into much detail. And a lot of honeybee scientists get, get um, allergic reactions to bees. You develop them over time. And so beekeepers tend to not get the, the allergy as much as bee scientists because they get stung all the time. And so if you're getting stung continually, 
usually you don't get the allergy, but if it gets done, you know, you know, consistently, but not all the time, then you, you're more likely to get it. And so scientists like me, I, I'm doing bee stuff for a few weeks, and then I'm in the lab, you know, working with the pipettes and stuff, and then I don't get stung for a long time, and it's done again. So I have a friend who got a bee allergy, and she got anaphylactic shock. She passed out in the apiary, and they took her to the hospital. The whole, you know, the whole enchilada, and then she got this apitherapy, and she was she wanted to soldier on. I probably would quit. But she wanted a soldier on it, so we went, we went with her to get this. And so it's just what Eric said. They start with a very small dose of the venom, and they give it to you in a shot. And then they build up to one you know, sting's worth of, of venom, and then you're, you're cured. But, when you, but what, what they actually do is, so if you have this, if you're allergic, you go through the, the anaphylactic shot every time that you get this shot. And so she, she was sitting there, and the nurse came over, and they, they, they gave her the shot, and she started to sweat profusely. She broke out in hives, and then she had her hand up and called the nurse, oh, I, is this normal? I, I feel like I'm going to die. And then the nurse looked at her, it, yeah, it's fine, you know, we're watching you. And, and, that, and that's, that, that, that's how it goes. So she was sitting there terrified for an hour, and so it, it builds up to a crescendo of, of horribleness, and then it starts to... <laughs> to level out, and she had to do this 10 times every single day sitting there. So their first real job is to be a nurse bee. So the nurse bees, um, they have a physiology that's specialized for feeding the young, and they also feed the queen. So this is a, a nurse bee on uh, some comb with, with larvae. So the, the big fat larvae are older, they require more feeding. The little small ones require less feeding. And so the nurses, they go around, they inspect, they see who needs you know, how much food, and they give it to them. They also feed the queen. The queen is basically a big giant egg laying machine. Behaviorally, she's really simple. She can't really f care for herself. She can't do much of anything except lay eggs. And she, can't, she doesn't really feed herself. So these nurses feed her. And, they, and then what's, what's kind of interesting is that they feed her at a rate at which they want her to, egg, to lay eggs. And so at some times of the year, she's laying a lot of eggs. And then the nurses are feeding her a lot. At other times of the year, the, the, there's not a lot of food out there, and the colony's not growing anymore. They're, they're just trying to maintain. Then they feed her much less. And so they control her egg laying rate by, by, how, by how much they're feeding her. So the middle aged bees do all the work within the nest except for the brood care. They, their main tasks are they, they process nectar into honey. So the foragers, they collect the nectar, but they don't do anything with it in the nest. They just collect the nectar in the field, they come back, and they unload that nectar load to one of these middle aged bees. And then the middle aged bee turns it into honey, carries it up to the top of the nest, and unloads it in a cell, and then goes back to get a new load. And so this is uh, some honeycomb where they filled up all these cells, and they're capping these cells. They also have to decrease the moisture content in nectar, so nectar is very high in water, and it would, it would spoil if the bees didn't concentrate it. And so the, the, the concentrating of the nectar into honey is, is, requires a lot of labor, and these bees do that. They also um, make, they secrete the wax, and they make the comb. That's their other major task. But they do another function. They start, because the middle-aged bees are processing nectar into honey. And so depending on what the bee is doing, these, this is just one gland, but there's glands all throughout the body. And so this is happening you know, in, in many different tissues throughout the bee's body every time they make one of these transitions. And then there are hormonal changes. They don't have testosterone and estrogen like we have, but they have sort of insect equivalents. They have like a juvenile hormone and a bunch of other hormones that are specific to insects, but which serve the same purpose as as our, our, our hormones. So I just want to run through the, the, the four groups and, and what they do. So the newly emerged bees do the least. They don't, they don't do a whole lot. And these are the baby bees. And so here, this picture is of bees emerging. So this is a comb. This is, this is comb that's um, closed brood, cap brood. And then this bee is, has just chewed its way out. That's just its, that's its head. It's, it's about to pull itself out of the comb. These two bees are chewing their way out of the comb. And so when a bee first emerges, when it chews its way out of the comb, its, it's, its skin, its cuticle is soft, it hasn't hardened yet, its flight muscles aren't mature yet, all of its physiology is still immature. And so the bee is still maturing, and it doesn't really complete you know, its development until about three days. And so the first few days of a bee's life, it doesn't really do much of anything except eat pollen, stand around, and continue development. The one task that it does do is it, it cleans cells. And so the, they tend to stay in this, this brood zone. So this is a honeybee nest. There's a lot of honey at the top. And then there's a, a big brood zone at the bottom. And the brood zone is a lot um, warmer than the honey zone. And so they, it's fat, they can continue development faster if they stay in here. So basically, they stand around in here. They clean cells. 
and they, they eat a lot, and they don't, they don't do a whole lot. They're kind of like our kids. They have, they have a few chores, but they're not really required to work as hard as the other, as the other bees. General terms about, about what I mean by these, these casts and how they're, how they're organized. And scientists tend to have a lot of fancy terminology that sometimes is necessary, sometimes isn't necessary. And so if you say that the bees have, so the technical term for this is polyphenism. What it means is that the bees go through puberty four times. And so it's exactly the same sort of biology that underlies these transitions, that underlies our, our changes that occur at, at, at puberty. When we're young, we have certain hormonal titers. Some hormones are at low levels and some are at high levels. And that leads to us having a certain physiology and certain behavioral patterns. Then we reach a certain age and our hormonal titers change. We, we develop secondary sexual characteristics. Our behavior changes. We're interested in things we weren't interested in before. So the bees do this too, but they do it four times, and it's exactly the same sort of process. Each time they go through one of these transitions, and they transition into a new task, their hormonal titers change, and their body re-specializes itself for their new tasks. And so I just have one example here. So the, the bees have these different glands all throughout their body, and the glands are specialized for, for different tasks depending on what they're doing. So one of these is called the hypophrangial gland. It's, the, it's a big gland in their mouth that they use to secrete brood food when they're young. And so this is, you can kind of see here that this gland is at its maximum size when they're in this, this age range, and this is the nursing age range. So before that, it's, it's really small, and then when they transition out of this cast, it drops in size really quickly. At the concurrent with this drop in size, there's an increase in the, in the invertase content. So invertase is an enzyme that, that converts nectar into honey. It basically modifies the, the, the sugar concentration in the nectar and makes it more stable over time. And so when the bees are secreting brood food, they're not making any of this invertase. But then when they stop secreting the brood food, then they turn on this going through this and the doctors are monitoring to see, it. is it too much? Do we have to like, you know, step in and make sure you don't die? It, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's horrible. So. I don't know what I would do if that happened. So it, the, in the program, it says I'm going to talk about how bees make honey and what they do with it when, when we don't steal it. I'm actually going to forego the, the second thing because I think the first part's much more interesting and the second part's not so fascinating. They eat the honey. They eat it in lots of different ways. They put it to lots of uses. So you can there's a lot of interesting stuff there. But I think their communication and how they talk to each other is the more fascinating part. So I'm going to, I'm going to focus on that. First, before I get into the, the specifics of how they make honey and how they cooperate to do that, I want to give you a, a little bit of background about how a honeybee colony works and how it's organized and who does what, and sort of the overview of, of what's going on in a bee nest. And then I'll talk about who within that overall structure cooperates to make honey. So when you look at a bee nest, there's, um, they're all, there are thousands, you know, uh, at their maximum size, they tend to be about 40,000 bees in nature, and they all look the same. So a lot of social insects, like ants and termites, they have soldiers that are really big with giant heads and big jaws, and they have little workers and medium-sized workers that are all doing different tasks. But the honeybees and the wasps, they don't have that. They have all these workers that look identical, but they're actually differentiated, and they have a strong division of labor within the nest. It's just physiological and it's temporal. So different ages of bees are doing different tasks in the nest. The honeybee has four tasks. Um, there's a new, there are newly emerged bees, these are the baby bees, there's nurses, there's middle-aged bees, and there's foragers. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these groups and what they do. So before I get to the specifics of what bees do, I think it's good to sort of you know, talk 